Hello, this is David Green, founder and CEO of R3 Medical Training. Today we're going to talk about the basics of PRP therapy for providers, basically what as a provider you should know. Now here's what we're going to talk about, what's in it, what it is, what's in it, uh, single versus double spin, there is some controversy about you know, what's the gold standard, and then some of the indications and research. I'm not going to delve into the history of PRP. Um, but before it got popular in musculoskeletal, uh, which is predominantly what we're talking about, it's been used heavily and still is for wound healing, dentistry, uh, cardiac surgery, things like that. But we're going to focus on the musculoskeletal. So the definition of PRP is it is an autologous blood sample that has a platelet concentration above that contained in a normal baseline blood plasma. And platelets contain over 30 bioactive proteins, many of which have a fundamental role in tissue healing. Everybody thinks about them as being so great for clotting, and they are, but the fact is they do so much more. So when you're talking about clinical PRP, when you look at normal blood, there are 200,000 platelets per microliter on average. Studies that have been done looking at uh, what it takes to, uh, for bone and soft tissue enhancement with healing is increasing that to a million platelets per microliter and when you do the math that's a billion platelets per milliliter so when you're talking about clinical PRP um, in a typical five milliliter treatment that would be five billion platelets so we're not going to go through all this but just suffice it there's about seven to some people say 12 growth factors in PRP um, and here's the predominant ones, platelet-derived growth factor, TGF, beta, VEGF, epidermal, fibroblasts, connective tissue growth factor, and insulin-like growth factor. And this is predominantly where the you know, bioactive effects of PRP come from is these particular growth factors. So activating PRP is a fairly complicated process, but we'll start at the, the top here. The activation causes granules um, in the platelet to fuse to the cell membrane. That's called degranulation. Then uh, it activates the proteins and growth factors which get secreted and most of this takes place within one hour. Okay, It's not really really lengthy uh, delay. This leads to some intracellular activation um, in the recipient which creates some gene sequencing which does all the things that we love about PRP. Directing cellular proliferation, collagen synthesis, etc which provokes tissue repair and regeneration. Okay, so when you prepare PRP, um, the blood comes from the patient, and you collect the blood just like you normally would at a lab, um, and then you put it into uh, the tube or the kit. Um, there are so many of them out there. We're going to talk about m -site. Um But when you do the first spin, um, and the first spin is in a centrifuge um, and it could be for m site it's only one minute for some systems it's like five or ten minutes um, but it's got to be very fast usually between three to four thousand rpms and what you'll find is that the blood separates so the red blood cells are at the bottom they're the heaviest so they go to the bottom um, we really don't want these studies have shown various uh, de deleterious effects of rbc's uh, such as blood in the joints leading to degenerative changes. Um, studies showing synovial fluid that was treated with RBCs results in cell death. So really, we don't want this part much at all. Okay, so that gets discarded. The top layer is mostly just plasma. We'll talk about plasma in a minute. And then the middle part is called the Buffy coat, which I think I've, yeah. The Buffy coat is rich in white blood cells and platelets. And actually, this arrow should be up here. Um, and here are the five major types of white blood cells. Okay, there's neutrophils, lymphocytes, eosinophils, monocytes, and basophils. And it's a very good idea to elucidate that there are different types of white blood cells because some we want and some we don't. So here's another illustration uh, showing the top layer, which is plasma. And, and that has water in it, proteins as well as various nutrients with amino acids and sugars and hormones. So it's not a useless layer, 
it is can be very helpful and we do want a significant amount of that now if you're just going to do a single spin then you would use this middle layer here once again the arrow should be here uh, it's called the buffy coat and it does have a lot of leukocytes which are white blood cells and platelets so if you just do a single spin and use this middle layer the buffy coat that would be a leukocyte rich PRP okay now here's the process as we talked about collecting the blood putting it in the tube or the kit centrifuging it in the machine and then if you're just going to do a single spin aspirating out the buffy coat trying to minimize the amount of red blood cells you get and having some plasma in there is just fine all right second spin you would take the top layer which is mostly pla is plasma and the middle layer the buffy coat and transfer that out okay what you don't want as i mentioned is the red blood cells the bottom layer those get that you want discarded so most kits you aspirate until you get a tinge of pink um, which is where the red blood cell layer starts and then you stop okay when you do a second spin what you're going to end up with is a large top layer which is mostly platelet poor plasma okay and then the platelets you're going to spin to the bottom and that's where your platelet rich plasma is all right so PPP and PRP okay now some of the questions that we have uh, to date still after a lot of research is should you activate it or not what's the optimal type of PRP to use should you use a leukocyte rich you know with just one spin or do a second spin where you have a leukocyte poor or do you use PRP by itself or along with stem cells and or exosomes so we'll go through some of the answers to this um, moving forward but yeah, there's no gold standard. So here's an example of why um, our um, company recommends uh, M-Site. And here's why. Um, this study looked at a comparison of a lot of different systems. Um, and leukocyte poor would be those that have a second spin capability. Um, and then the comparison, you know, M-Site showed <clears throat> really good uh, concentrated volume produced and as well as uh, could it produce PPP what's the increase in platelets from baseline and here you get you know clinical grade of five times and what's the ca uh, capture efficiency so the higher the uh, uh, increase in platelets the better to a point you know if once if, if you get really up to like 10 or 11 or 12 you're probably going a little too far with it but um, you know you definitely want a clinical grade So when you look at the M-Site system, it offers upwards of 9 billion platelets in a 7 milliliter sample. Really good control of the neutrophils. They are the most abundant leukocyte, and they show up very quickly at the injury site. Normally, they are cleared quickly by the macrophages, but if not, they die and release all their pro-inflammatory contents. So if you have very high neutrophil counts, which is what you have after a single spin, then you can actually create a bigger problem you know, for the first week or two with just that, um, as opposed to having the second spin where you keep the monocytes and, um, but take out a lot of the neutrophils. Now, does age affect PRP quality? This is something that, you know, um, I used to think did, um, and that people who are of advancing age shouldn't have. Uh, PRP you know maybe should have something else like just stick with exosomes or stem cells but this study in 2004 showed no significant changes in platelet concentration or growth factors in relation to age or gender so what that says to me is it doesn't matter if somebody's 70 versus 50 you still have the concentrations necessary you know produ produce clinical grade PRP so we're going to go through some indications and what the research shows, whether it's for uh, soft tissue problems like an Achilles tendonitis, plantar fasciitis, rotator cuff tendonitis, um, elbow and greater trochanteric uh, bursitis tendonitis, or, and then joint arthritis as well, and along with the spine. All right, so for Achilles tendonitis, 
This study looked at a PRP injection for chronic Achilles tendinopathy. Uh, it was out of JAMA. It was over 50 patients, aging, aging is 80 to, 18 to 70. Um, <clears throat> this was chronic mid-portion Achilles tendinopathy versus a saline injection, and it didn't work. It did not result in greater improvement in pain and activity, um, which you know would, would lend the argument against PRP for this type of Achilles tendinopathy. Now, for plantar fasciitis, um, this was out of the Malaysian Orthopedic Journal just last year, and it showed that um, PRP injections were extremely helpful uh, for plantar fasciitis. For instance, if you look at the visual analog scale table here, uh, before treatment was around seven. Six weeks out, the steroids actually were doing better. But look what happens when you go to three months and to six months. The PRP group gets better and better. It just keeps on getting better. And this was statistically significant. Now, for rotator cuff issues, this study um, was a meta-analysis. What that means is it pulls together several studies, in this case five, which accumulated over 200 patients in the Journal of Arthroscopy last year. And, you know, all these meta-analyses meta uh, include studies that are done differently, so they include the same uh, uh, limitations with uh, limited available evidence using PRP for non-operative treatment of chronic rotator cuff disease. It just may not be beneficial. So for rotator cuff issues, um, what we recommend uh, from these studies and others is basically PRP plus uh, a stem cell biologic or exosome. So let's look at jumper's knee. There's two studies out there that showed really good results. Um, this one, Liddell and all, showed 81% of patients returned to pre-symptom levels of activity. And this one showed better pain relief and function with two injections versus one. Um, so both these studies used a leukocyte-rich preparation, meaning just one spin. And PRP does appear to be a viable treatment option for chronic jumper's knee. Um, and probably a leukocyte-rich preparation. And if you go by the zany and all data, you probably should do more than one, um, separated out by three to six weeks. Tennis elbow um, has been actually very well studied. This was a meta-analysis uh, that was done fairly recently over the last year. And it did show that PRP was better at reducing pain in the short and the long term versus steroid. And the effects lasted up to two years. Uh, which is pretty much what the follow-up was for the study. Um, additionally, versus steroid, you don't have that subcutaneous fat atrophy, which is always uh, uh, unpleasing cosmetically and uh, a little alarming to patients. Um, and what another study showed that leukocyte rich yielded better long-term results than lidocaine or dry needling. So once again, um, probably just one spin for uh, treatment of tennis elbow. All right, so partial tears of elbow ligaments. Um, you know, in the major leagues, this is the ulnar collateral ligament, right? And then a lot of times, if you have a significant tear in that or, or a full tear, a uh, pitcher goes on to need Tommy John surgery. Um, however, it may not be necessary with PRP. So Podesta and all followed the progress of 34 throwing athletes who had partial thickness tears, who only had a single PRP injection, and 30 of them were able to return to the same level of play or higher uh, within a few months. So as opposed to being out for a whole year with a Tommy John surgery, potentially you can um, avoid it. Here's an example of Shohei Otani. He is uh, remarkable. He plays for the Angels, and he's able to pitch, and he plays the outfield, you know, and hit home runs. So, you know, no, nobody exists like him um, in the major league. So... He's just one example of somebody who did well, at least for a while, with PRP therapy. Um, several pitchers, New York Yankees right-hander Masahiro Tanaka, this guy from Boston Red Sox, Chris Sale, had PRP therapy injection as conservative treatment and continued to pitch. O Otani, unfortunately, he did well initially. He was able to finish the season, I believe, in 2017. Um, and then he did end up needing surgery uh, after the season was over, but it did allow him to at least finish the season uh, before he needed the surgery. All right, girded trochanteric bursitis. 
This is pretty exciting. PRP versus surgery. Um, they both did well in these uh, meta-analysis of 10 studies, over 200 patients. Um, so they both did well. PRP therapies did really well, equivalent to surgery, but they didn't have all the complication rates, right? Like re-tears or blood clots or wound issues, snapping hip. So it's better, obviously, to try PRP therapy uh, first. Here's a compilation of arthritis studies. There's a lot of them out there. So in this table, it's actually very helpful. You can see that all these knee studies, there's eight of them. Seven out of eight showed positive results with PRP therapy. So when you look, and then in the hip, two out of four were positive. And when you look at what the preparation that was used in most of these studies, um, that was positive outcome, it was leukocyte poor. That means that the blood was put through a second spin and you end up with a low level of neutrophils, but you maintain the monocytes. So it really does starting to show us a clear path here that leukocyte poor PRP is better in hips and knees and you can get a very satisfactory outcome. So here's one that looked at 14 different studies and over 1,400 patients. They showed that intraarticular PRP injections probably are more effective in the treatment of knee arthritis uh, compared with uh, saline, placebo, hyaluronic acid, ozone, corticosteroids. And this was upwards of a year of follow-up. Should you do one injection or multiple? Uh, this study looked at that. Last year, 95 patients were looked at for only four months, but they did find that the effectiveness of PRP did increase after multiple injections um, three weeks apart. For the spine, this is a study in 2019, um, which showed that the, a subset of patients demonstrated clinically significant improvements in pain and function from five to nine years post-injection of PRP into the disc, which is remarkable to have that long of a follow-up with excellent results. For uh, facet arthritis, um, this is a Russian study that looked at almost 50 patients for a year and a half, and they found that there was a persistent significant reduction of pain symptoms and increase in function in the early and late post-procedure post periods with low risks of uh, complications. And looking at TMJ, um, this was a meta-analysis looking at six different studies and showed that four out of six showed superiority with PRP for TMJ with range of motion and pain um, upwards of a year. So that is remarkable. You know, TMJ is very, very frustrating, um, and this is fantastic to be able to have that kind of an option. So in conclusion, PRP is very low risk. Um, you know, typically patients may have increased pain for a few days, after the procedure due to the inflammation that it creates. Um, studies that have looked at the differences in pain versus a single or a double spin really don't show much of a, of a difference. You know, people think the second spin is going to reduce those neutrophils and decrease pain, but that's really in theory. Um, we do have a lot of unanswered questions. You know, what is the optimal dose? We think it's, you know, five to seven times normal platelet concentration where you can get a billion platelets per milliliter. That's what we think is best. Should you activate or not? Um, it's not hard to activate, you know, using calcium citrate or something like that. But we do know that once you inject PRP, it gets activated anyway underneath the skin with all the bioactivity. So, you know, do you need to activate? A lot of people say no. Um, but others are adamant about it. Do you use leukocyte rich or leukocyte poor? Well, I could, you know, we just looked at some studies where leukocyte rich showed better results in the soft tissue problems, whereas leukocyte poor was better in the joints. So that's what most people will do. Um, but there is no gold standard right now. We have a lot of positive studies out there. Um, and PRP therapy is, is a great option. Um, most of our clinics will use stem cells and or exosomes along with PRP. Why? Well, there's in theory that, that some of those activate the PRP more and vice versa. There's um, uh, a lot of data that, that we've seen 
um, as well as anecdotal showing that it does better for things like, you know, sexual wellness and hair restoration and uh, for, you know, joint issues, gives longer lasting results um, and, and so on and so forth. So that's what we've seen and that's why most providers are adding um, the two. Um, you know, a lot of them inject them separately, but the results uh, have been fantastic. So R3 Medical is partnered with R3 Stem Cell uh, for providers nationwide with its partnership program. We have a large network, over 40 centers, that we help with for patient acquisition with marketing. Uh, and this includes uh, online as well as seminar marketing. Uh, we actually come in and do the seminars, so practices do not have to worry about it. We offer an incredible amount of sales support. You know, what's the use of getting a lot of patients in if you're having trouble converting them? Uh, we have first-rate products at significant uh, savings, uh, usually 30% lower than what the lab will charge for them. We have over seven IRB-approved uh, protocols. We do have extensive uh, provider training, and that's either online or in person, where you can you know, see, do, and have procedures, which is remarkable for a provider to be able to you know, empathize and, and with uh, his or her patients. So um, it really is an all-in-one regenerative medicine program, which will help you to acquire new patients, convert them for procedures, and then use our protocols. So call us today at 844-GET-STEM. Be happy to talk with you about your practice and how we can help. And the other place to see more information is just go to r3stemcell.com, and you click on For Providers, and you'll see all the information about the program um, and then give us a call. Thank you so much. Hope you enjoyed this.